Gosh, that table's heavy. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, th fantastic, fantastic talk, by the way. I related to a lot of that. And I know that a lot of that is quite difficult to say. Uh, and as someone who has uh, spent the last, well, most of my adult life, in fact, saying controversial things, uh, I know uh, how difficult it can be to say, uh, to say controversial things. So today, I may just out controversy even myself. And I am going to talk about something that is very uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable uh, for me, actually. It's uncomfortable for many of us. But the fact that it's uncomfortable is why we must talk about it. And I've said this many, many times. Uh, Nigel Farage has, uh, for example, recently said Donald Trump makes him feel uncomfortable. And my response to that is leaders talk about things that are uncomfortable. They don't go around looking for things that make them feel happy and think I'm only going to talk about that. You talk about the tricky bits. Generation identity. Uh, what an, a, speaking of controversy, pretty much a controversial group. And one of the main reasons, and we all know what hope not hate and the rest of that lot do. We know what they do. They'll take one sentence out of an hour long speech and make that your, they'll define you by it for the rest of your life. So I've no doubt that they've done the same to generation identity. I have no doubt. I have read, according to what I have read online, I am a far left, far right, uh, anti-Semitic, Zionist, uh, feminist who wants to sterilize women. This is me. So I give absolutely everybody the same benefit of the doubt that I uh, would, uh, would like for myself. So I make no judgment at all on the controversy that generation identity finds itself in, but I will pick up on one of the main reasons it finds itself in such hot water, and I will discuss it at some length. And that is the use of the words, but the meaning of the words, the great replacement. This is a minefield, an absolute minefield. Now, I'm already called a racist and a Nazi, so if you're doing the time, you may as well do the crime. Let's actually talk about these things. So what does the Great Replacement mean? I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm not going to tell genera generation identity what it means. I'm going to assume what it means. And I'm going to put it very frankly and very bluntly. It means the replacement of white Europe with non-Europeans. Uh, here are some facts. I can already, I can, uh, even in a room like this, you can already say it. You can feel the tension rising when somebody says the replacement of white Europe with non-Europeans. You can already feel it. So let me start with the basics. Let's start with where I always like to start. I always find it's a good place to start with some facts. Let's start with some facts. Here's a fact. Europe is majority white, fact. Uh, and, let's, and before we get into the, uh, you know, you spoke at great length, sir, about uh, the meaning of words, and I understand the importance of that. However, I also think we mustn't get too tied up sometimes in what words mean. When I say white, I mean white. People may come to me and say, do you mean Celtic or Slavic? What do you mean by white? What kind of white? I mean white. Let's just leave it there. I mean white. I realise there are many different kinds of whites, but let's just leave it there. I mean white. Nobody says that about black people, by the way. When you say black culture, nobody says, what do you mean black people? Do you mean African? Do you mean Caribbean? What do you mean? No, never happens. It's only with us. It's only with whites. European non-whites. There are, of course, European non-whites. But here's another uncomfortable fact. Such Europeans who are non-white will have, at this time in our history, so I'm not talking about 10,000 years or 40,000 years or 50,000 years ago. I'm talking about now. I'm talking about where we live now. And you, uh, talk, uh, I'm sorry to keep referring, but it was a very good speech, and, and you, you gave me a couple of points I wanted to mention. Uh, you mentioned that Christi Christianity is not a European religion. Of course, if you go back far enough, it isn't. But for us, it is. Uh, and for us, Islam isn't. And that's what I mean when I say you can sometimes just get too bogged down in words. Let's talk like we do in our everyday lives. Let's live in our everyday lives. And in our everyday lives, if you're a, a non-white European, you will have someone in your family, either your parents or your grandparents, who do not come from Europe. You will have someone, a family members, who come from elsewhere. I, as a white European, do not have family members who come from elsewhere. All of my family members are white Europeans. These are, again, 
facts. We do have another fact. There is, at this time, very, very large numbers of non-white Europeans living in Europe and non-white Europeans themselves. But another reality is that this change has happened with rapid, a, a rapid, absolutely rapid transformation. And it's still coming. It's still happening. Around 300,000 people come into Britain a year, every year, around 300,000 people. That's an extraordinary number of people. And it is incomparable to any level of immigration seen in Europe in its history. We are, here's another fact, we're different. We're not all alike. We are not all the same. And the left will have you believe this. They will tell you, and when I say the left, I mean the mainstream, because the left have bullied everything, all of their beliefs into the mainstream, so much so that the conservatives are now too afraid to be politically incorrect. These are not conservatives. I mean, Boris Johnson may be the most conservative conservative we've had for some time, but they're still not conservatives. We are different, and Europe's development has been different to the development of other parts of the world. And that has carried on in us, biologically, evolutionary. It's in us. It's how it, we are born with this. White Europeans are born with a certain identity, as you very well described. And part of that identity is the history of Europe, the history of democratic revolution, the foundation of democracy itself, secularism, the birth of science, reason, evidence, that we don't, as they do in many Muslim countries today, look to a book, an ancient scripture from the Bronze Age, and find all the answers in there. We don't do that in Europe. We have science, we have reason, we have evidence. That's what our society, our modern society, is built on. Now someone is going to say to me, but several hundred years ago, we had the Spanish Inquisition. We used to torture and kill people. Yes, we did, and then we stopped because science and reason and evidence and justice, natural justice, were born. It became a part of who we were, and it is still a part of who we are today. But Europe's story has been interrupted, and our story is our story. It's what I've just described, the development of European civilization. That's our story. Our story should continue as our story, but instead we've had this interruption We've had this massive uh, yeah, intrusion, intrusion from other parts of the world and thrown our story off course. We now have other people's story coming in and it distorting our story, changing our society from the outside. Societies will always change, but we should change them. They should not be changed from the outside by force. And this brings us to the differences. Europe developed as it developed. Africa developed differently. Asia developed differently. We have not all got the same history. We are a varied, colourful world of a variety of different religions and a variety of different cultures. And to throw us all in together like this, we're in these massive, massive numbers, is utter, utter madness. And it is also, more than that, it's a crime against us native Europeans. Let's look at Pakistan as an example of why it matters. So first of all, let's answer the question. Before I move on to Pakistan, let's answer the question. Is the Great Replacement happening? The left, again, and by which I mean the mainstream, will tell you absolutely not. How dare you, you Nazi, you racist, you fascist. No, there's no Great Replacement, what are you talking about? Those same people will celebrate when London becomes minority English. They will tell you that we're all alike. Hashtag more in common. We're all the same, really. What difference does it make? Why are you talking about ethnicity? Why are you talking about race? Why are you talking about Europe versus non-Europe? It doesn't matter. We're all the same. Those very same people will be advocating multiculturalism the next day. They will be talking about how wonderful diversity is. They will walk into a room and say, there's far too many white people in this room. Where's the diversity? But, but I thought you said it didn't matter. I thought you said it didn't matter in the slightest. We're all alike, aren't we? We're more in common, aren't we? So why must we have diversity? Of course we are different. 
Of course we are different. We have different groups, we have different cultures, we have different value systems around the world. I am talking globally, and of course even within Europe there are a variety, uh, very similar but still different. So let's look to give an example of how, yes, the Great Replacement is happening. I've mentioned that white English are now a minority in London, soon to be a minority in Birmingham. And if you want a future, if you want to look at where diversity, which is, uh, I will deal with that word in a second, actually leads us to, unfettered diversity leads us to, you need to look at a town called Dewsbury in Yorkshire. Uh, usually when I say Dewsbury in Yorkshire, people go, oh dear. If you're not familiar with Dewsbury in Yorkshire, do, find, do make yourself familiar with Dewsbury in Yorkshire. It is now above 90%, if I'm correct, and in fact, I don't know what the, I'm going to say above 90% because I've seen a few different figures. I've even seen as high as 98%. Above 90% Muslim. This town in Yorkshire. Uh, white people simply don't live there anymore. And if it didn't matter, if we were all the same, if it was all hashtag more in common, why would this be the case? Because Muslims who come from Pakistan, not every Muslim, of course, I don't, I shouldn't need to say this, and I will deal with micro and macro in a second. Not every Muslim rejects our way of life, but many, many, many do. And those many are coming here, and they don't like what they find, and they reject us, and they don't like white people. They think white people are, are degenerate in many respects. They don't like the idea that we can speak freely, that we can insult religion, that we can mock our politicians or mock revered leaders or whatever it may be. They don't like this. But to us, it's our DNA. I can't ever imagine living in a society where you can go to prison for criticizing the government. But maybe I should. Maybe I should start imagining such a society. We can't live together, big groups, for the simple reason that our value systems are so different. I can never and will never accept any value system, culture or religion that ties a little girl down and removes her clitoris. I will never, ever accept that. And yet, as a British citizen and as a white native European, I'm being asked to accept that. Not only am I being asked to accept it, I'm being asked to celebrate it. I'm being asked to welcome disgusting, horrific criminal practices into my world, into the world that my ancestors built for me, that built the freedom, the fought for the freedoms that we have. I am now being asked to welcome horror, sheer horror, into my world. And I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want it normalised in Europe that we butcher children. I don't want it normalised in Europe that we marry seven or eight year old girls to old men. That is what I'm being asked to accept. We are being asked in Europe not only to accept massive numbers of people, but massive numbers of people we cannot relate to, we have nothing in common with, and whose daily cultural practices sicken us, repulse us. We are being asked to accept this, we are being asked to celebrate it. We are being asked to reduce ourselves beneath it. Not only celebrate, not only, we're not asked to make this culture or these cultures equal to our culture. We are being asked to reduce ourselves below these cultures. We're being asked to turn our back on centuries, millennia of European development and progress and civilization and reduce ourselves beneath a culture which stones each other to death, which has kangaroo courts with accusations of cavorting with the devil can get you tortured. I will not accept this. I don't accept it as equal to my culture. I certainly don't accept it as superior to my culture. I will describe it to you. It is inferior to my culture. Rap enormously, hugely inferior to my culture. And it's not inferior because my culture comes from white people. It's inferior because it's inferior. 
because it's immoral, because it's violent, because it's unjust, because it's based on fairy tales written hundreds of years ago by insane warlords. I do not accept this. But I certainly won't put myself as inferior to that, as we white Europeans are being asked to do. And again, the left will jump up and down about this. Whites, are, whites have all the power in society. Well, we are a white society, so most of our powerful people are going to be white. It's a given, really. But what people, what white people, the only, the only group, the only racial group on this planet, and here's the real, real drag, the real drug of this, the real, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, the thing that most nauseates me, I guess, and the thing that's most obvious. We're being told that the world is becoming multiculturalism, the, bo the multicultural, the borders are coming down, we're all going to live together, we're all going to skip happily through the long grass hand in hand, like Little House on the Prairie, it's all going to be absolutely wonderful. We're, but only white countries are expected to do this. Why is that? Why is it that if the whole world is going to melt into one, why is all the immigration coming in our direction only, and not in any other direction? Let me tell you what white people are asked to accept. Not only the denigration of our culture and the majorities, the countries that we built. Uh, and by the way, uh, if the Pope, I was, <laughs> I was actually going to say if the Pope is listening to this, I sincerely doubt it. <laughs> but the Pope told us recently that Europe, now get this, Europe was built by immigrants. That's what he said. So here's what's being done to white people. Our history is being rewritten. Europe was built by immigrants, according to the Pope. Now, I have no idea where those immigrants came from or who was in Europe before they came. It, uh, Europe was apparently empty until all these immigrants came and built it. No, false, a lie. Europeans built Europe, not immigrants. We're also told in this ridiculous attempt at science that happened a couple of years back, you may remember this, that the first Britain was black. Do you remember this? Cheddarman. Cheddar Man, that's the one. What do you think is the message in that? Do you think that's a really, do you think science is the priority when they told us that the first Britain was black? Do you, do you think science, do you think history, uh, uh, truth was the aim there? It's the aim is to tell white Britons that they have no home. This does not belong to you. Be grateful you're allowed to live here at all. That's the message. We are also told we are excluded from job applications. We are told there are too many of us on this board, too many in this room, too many white children in this school. We want diversity. We want diversity, which means fewer white people. That's all it means. That's all it has ever meant. No one walks into a room and says, uh, well, actually, some of them do, uh, but it's not quite as obvious as saying that we don't want white people in this room. So instead of saying we don't want white people in this room, they instead say we need diversity in this room. That's what diversity means. It means getting rid of whites. White privilege. There's an interesting one. We are, whites are so privileged that you are, cannot be guilty of hating us for our skin colour. That's how privileged we are. Now, you can hate a black person for their skin colour, you can hate an Asian person for their skin colour, I know Asian is a big word, but you can hate a non-white person for their skin colour, even if you don't actually hate them. Merely to comment on a black person or a non-white person will make you a racist if you're white. I and mean, it's been addressed already that only whites can be racist, of course, when actually, in reality, we're probably the re least racist people in the world. Uh, and I believe that's true. It's a big statement, but I believe it's true. People from all over the world, I've known people from all over the world, and the racism is extraordinary from other groups, absolutely extraordinary. And yet, somehow, whites are so privileged that we're the only ones who can be racist. We're the only ones who can be racist. We're the only ones not entitled to a homeland. We're the only ones uh, who are excluded from job applications. We're the only ones told that our culture is awful and we ought to trans trample on it in order to accommodate people from other sides of the world. We are also the only ones who you can't hate for our skin color. 
That's where white privilege came from. Because when the left began to dismantle Western civilization with this nonsense, they came up with the word racist as a catch-all. Any dissenter, you're a racist. So eventually they realized that actually people who aren't white can also express racial hatred. It's not only white people who have racial hatred towards others. So when they discovered this, they thought, we've got to come up with something. Racist doesn't work anymore. Because if we use racist, then it can be used to decry all of the horrible things we are doing to white people. So we're going to have to come up with something to make sure that this mistreatment, this objective oppression and suppression, and that is what it is, of white people that is happening in the West today, we can't possibly have that called racism because we need the word racism as a weapon to throw at white people. So we cannot possibly allow them to use it for protection. So they came up with white privilege and this power structure stuff. So it's all, it's all institutional power structures. That's what racism is really all about. So if you're in a white majority country and white people have most of the power, as is obvious, then it's institutionally racist. It's a given. It's a given. So then racism goes off into intersectionality and all these other little excuses that they've got. So you're oppressed once, twice, three times, all of it by white people. And white people can't fall into these categories. So we're privileged. We're so privileged that you can exclude us, legally exclude us from job applications and we can't complain. You can trample on our culture and tell us that it needs to go. And if we dare defend it, we can be called a racist. We can't complain about that either. We can, the law treats us completely differently to non-white people, completely differently. And even, they're not even shy to say so. There are members of the, the judiciary who will say that people from non-white backgrounds are automatically underprivileged. Now there's racism, there's racism. So non-white people are automatically underprivileged, need, need a hand up by the white saviour, not actually independent, autonomous human beings at all, but victims, and victims of, guess who? White people. We are asked, we are asked to accept all of that. This goes, the anti-white hatred goes, as I have said many times, from the United Nations down to the local council. All of it is anti-white, all of it. The only reason that the mass migration into white Europe is happening on the scale that it's happening is to disempower white people, to make us a minority and therefore unable to hold political power, to wield political power. And if you want an example of where this was made obvious, it was in the United States when Donald Trump became president. White lash is what it was called. White people elected Donald Trump. How dare they? How, dare, how can it be that we are still in the scenario and the situation where white people can decide who the president is? This was, it was lamented, the whole country. And the and they, let's up, let's ramp up the mass immigration now. Let's get to the point where we outnumber whitey. And then whitey will never have any power anymore. And they're not even ashamed of it. Now, all of this... If you get into this with a lefty, and again, I'm not going to get into what I mean by lefty, you know what I mean. I'm speaking conversationally. If I get into this with a lefty, I will push them on it. It will eventually end up with one thing, and that is that whites are getting their comeuppance for colonialism. And this usually, well, pretty much always comes from self-hating white left-wingers. And it always comes back to that. You can push at it. You know, they'll bring in the altruism and all the other bits of, oh, how, look how lovely I am, that I'm willing to help strangers from the other side of the world at my own expense. I am that nice. But if you push them and you keep this thing going, you will find out. Eventually you'll get there. Eventually the nastiness will come out. And that nastiness is they getting what they deserve. Look what they did during the colonial era. Well, first of all, uh, and here's another bit of white privilege for you. We're the only ones who've ever done anything wrong. White people are the only ones who've ever conquered or colonized or invaded, ever. And not only are we the only ones who've ever done anything wrong, we're the only ones expected to pay for it forever and ever and ever. 
So when you get into this row with the lefty and they tell you that it's because of colonialism, white people are getting what they deserve, ask them if they believe then that revenge against descendants is a moral position to take. Do you punish the grandson for the crimes of the grandfather? And if you are going to punish the grandson for the crimes of the grandfather, when are we going to Turkey? When are we going to China? When are we going to Japan? When are we going to take their culture away because they once did something wrong as well? When is that going to happen? It isn't going to happen. We know it isn't going to happen. So let me give my, because this is complicated. It is complicated. And the word racism has no real meaning. I don't know what it means. Nowadays, people ask me if I'm a racist. I say, I don't know. Because I don't know what that means. I don't. I simply don't know. So let's look at a few options. Is a racist someone who lives in the real world? And who, as, we, as at, the t at the top of my talk, I said, we do live in a world of different skin colours. We are a differing, a ver varied species. We're different. Is just acknowledging difference, is that racism? Some would say it is. Some would say just the fact that I, I, I note that there are white people and there are black people. I know there are others, but I'm just trying to simplify this. Is that acknowledgement in itself racist? Some people would say, yes, it is. Is racism separation of races? As in, no one is superior or inferior to the other, but they live separately. Many people would say that was racism. Is racism one group feeling itself or legislating itself or socially uh, conducting itself as superior to another racial group? Is that racism? Uh, I suspect that the latter two could probably justifiably be called it. Uh, but the first one, not. The first one is simply reality. So let me give you my position on this. I acknowledge reality. I acknowledge the different racial groups on the, in the world. I also acknowledge, because humans are complicated, that we are all individuals. And then here's the micro and the macro. We are all individuals. We are all completely, completely unique. So do I believe that every black person or every Muslim or every Asian person is going to take my culture away? Of course I don't. This is, this is ridiculous. They're individuals. Every person I meet, I meet as an individual. I do not know that person. I don't know how they feel. I don't know what they think. I will get to know them first before I make any decision on what I think about them. Everyone is a blank sheet. Every human being is a blank sheet. You don't know them. Get to know them. But we are both individuals and members of groups. There's no, there's no inconsistency here. People say to me, which is it? Are we, are we individual or are we groups? We're both. We are both. I'm an individual, unique. There's only one of me. Thank God, I'm sure many of you are saying. <laughs> there's only one of me. But there isn't only one of my background. A British citizen, Irish ethnicity. I am both. I'm both. We are all both. We all belong to certain identities, as, as also that you mentioned. Some of them we're born into, some of them we acquire. But while we're all individuals, we also belong in groups. And we belong in those groups whether we like it or not. And those groups do have, have common cultures. It's perhaps one of the things that makes them a group. So whilst you can't uh, worry about an individual Muslim, because it's just an individual, you can worry about hundreds of thousands of Muslims, because hundreds of thousands of Muslims means Islam. And Islam means our, our culture will be changed. It will be pushed back. It will be diluted. It will be transformed into something more like that culture. And I don't want that culture. So to be very clear, I do not consider myself a racist for the pure reason that I consider every human being to be of equal value. I consider every person, regardless of their skin colour, to be an equal human being. None of that, I, and to be clear, I consider all British citizens to be equal, regardless of their skin colour. However, whilst nationality, I'm sure most of us in this room are British citizens, we're not all ethnically from this part of the world, and that's different. Nationality is very different from ethnicity. 
So whilst I, there are friends in my life, members of my party, supporters, whoever, who will be non-white, who will be descended, who have family from another part of the world, they're still British, they still have the rights, the, the, they are still a, a equally valid, valued British citizen, but they are not ethnically English. They are not, if you take, I'll, I'll take, uh, and I hope she doesn't mind me talking about it like this, I'll take Khadija, our deputy chair, born, in, born and raised in this country. She's British, but she's not ethnically English. She's ethnically Pakistani. She wouldn't argue with that. I'm not going to argue with it. It's different. It's completely different. And the ethnic Europeans are the majority. And I believe, and I believe very strongly, a few things. One, that the Great Replacement is happening. Uh, two, that it matters a great deal and that it will not be pleasant. The cultures we are importing will not be very pleasant ones. And especially given the case that, that we are importing cultures who hate us already, largely, into an anti-white situation. There are uh, people who come to this country, non-white people who come to this country, are encouraged from the moment they get off the plane to hate white people and to think that white people owe them something, and to be angry at white people. I don't accept this. I don't accept this. So what my personal policy is, and what I want my party to fight for, is the equal dignity of all British citizens. Absolutely. There's no two ways about this. There's no backpedaling. There's no compromise. We are all equal British citizens. However, there is a native ethnic group, several in fact, in this country who belong to these islands, whose families' histories go back to a point where you can't actually trace it back any farther, who know nothing but these islands. This is home. We don't have family from anywhere else. I think, given that, we have the right, white Europeans have the right to call ourselves the indigenous people of Europe. We have that right and we should demand it. It doesn't mean that we have any more rights or that we are better than non-white Europeans. It's merely a reflection of our ethnicity in the same way that other people's ethnicities are reflected around the world. Nobody, I guarantee you, is going to go to China and start complaining about the number of Chinese people or the number of Chinese authors or to try and get rid of their traditional foods. We shouldn't accept it either. And one way that we can do this is to defend our status as the indigenous people of Europe. We want United Nations, I want the United Nations gone, and the, the, the building bulldozed. Uh, and, and as I think Pat Condell said, let's pour salt over it as well so nothing can ever grow there. I want the UN gone. But the UN does lecture the world quite a lot on indigenous peoples. And its definition, the dictionary definition of indigenous is not from somewhere else, which I really like. It's quite poetic. The UN's definition is victims of colonialism. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? It, it's putting us as the devils immediately on their international documents. We are named as the devil and our victims are named as indigenous, and therefore they have rights to their traditional culture. But we? Absolutely not. In fact, they go further, and they say that the dominant race in a society cannot be indigenous. Who do you think they're talking about? They're talking about whites in Europe. So if we were indigenous, if we had indigenous status, we could fight legally for the protection and preservation of our culture. But because we do not have that, we are not actually seen as a group at all. We are simply seen as, I don't know what we're seen as, workers, taxpayers, paying the big tax bills in Europe so that we can feed the rest of the world while our own people go hungry. Is that what we are? The taxpayer. Pay your taxes and shut up. That's what white Europeans are. That's what being treated like. And I've had enough of it. I'm tired. I'm tired of my skin colour being insulted. I'm tired of the culture that us and our ancestors built, being told that it's worthless. If it's so worthless, then why is half the world trying to get into it? It's not. It's the greatest culture on earth. And I am proud to have been born into it. I am proud to be a part of it. But what's more, I will fight to protect it. I will fight 
to protect my identity as a European. I will fight to protect the identity of Europe itself. And I will fight to ensure that the hundreds, thousands of Europeans who died in the cause of making us the greatest civilization in the world are not betrayed. That we don't just turn our backs on their memory and say, yes, you died so we could be free. But we're going to hand that freedom away because we're afraid of being called nasty names if we don't. I want mass immigration to stop. I want Europeans to be named the indigenous, white Europeans to be named the indigenous of Europe. And I want all that that brings with it. Our rights, our legal and our moral right to our culture to remain dominant, to remain the majority and to remain free and civilised in Europe. That's what I'm here for. Uh, that's what my party is here for. And I shall leave it there. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, what do you think of the term itself, the Great Replacement? As in, you know, that we, we say to the public, the Great Replacement. It's very hard hitting. Very hard hitting. It's a little bit frightening because I'm not sure the country's ready for it yet. Uh, I'm not sure the country's ready for me yet either. Uh, I'm not sure the country's ready for my party yet. My thinking is I'll just keep building my party until the country is ready. And then when it's ready, so will I. Um, it's very hard hitting. It's, it's emotive. It it's, makes you feel somewhat frightened, somewhat attacked. Um, but maybe that's what's needed. Maybe that's what's needed. I'm, I'm unsure about I'm unsure about it. I probably wouldn't use it uh, as a slogan um, because of those reasons. But I also like it for those reasons. I think it works for those reasons. Um, and it and and yes, I, I know many will disagree, but yes, it is happening. It is happening. And and anyone who disagrees can uh, you know go to Dewsbury or uh, Stop talking about how great it is, how diverse we all are, because that's the opposite of what they're saying. But of course it's happening, of course it's happening. But yeah, emotive. Emotive is the word that springs to mind most. You mentioned that there are a lot of indigenous Europeans who are also <coughs> sort of propagating this issue in the first place, yeah. who are advocating for this diversity. Mm. How do you think we can change people's minds and make them see the issues with a multicultural society? Well, do you know what we have to do? The first thing we need to do is talk about it. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today is A, because I'm at Generation Identity, but B, uh, because it has to be talked about. I think this is bubbling away under the surface. I mean, we'll talk about culture, we'll talk about religion reluctantly, but we don't actually talk about race. Uh, and and there's, people are afraid to, and this is the one thing we have to overcome. The reason we don't talk about race, and this is another part of white privilege, isn't it? Uh, immediately, Immediately, if you say anything about the acknowledgement of the diff of, you know, that there are black people and there are white people, you'll immediately be called a racist, but then everyone will panic because they'll see Nazis immediately. They'll go straight from the acknowledgement that there are black people and there are white people straight into the gas chambers. They don't seem to see, you know, that you immediately talk about race, you're immediately a Nazi and you're going to be gassing people soon. You know, this is what, this is the panic the minute you start talking about these things. Look, let's, let's grow up a little bit. Let's all grow up a little bit. This reminds me of that, uh, what was it, Jordan Peterson, who did he do that interview with? That awful, that's her name, yeah, that's her. And it's quite famous now, isn't it, where he, she was saying, so what you're saying is, and actually he hadn't said that at all. And so this is one of those scenarios. I say, you know, white people should be, have the status of indigenous of Europe. And I'll get, so what you're saying is you hate black people. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. You know, we've got to, we've got to make, see, people panic about this issue. So let's reassure them. Let's reassure people that we're not talking about racial segregation. We're not talking about black people sitting at the back of the bus. We're not talking about anything horrible. We're simply talking about an acknowledgement of reality. And let's be fair here. If, if the Chinese, for what, that's just an example that pops into my head almost all the time actually. If the Chinese are entitled to their little bit of the world, and no one is going to go there and say, you Chinese are dreadful, your culture is awful, you really ought to lose it. No one's going to do that. So if they won't do it there, why do it here? 
I want consistency across the board. We do not have consistency. We have white people singled out on a global scale for punishment. And part of our punishment is to have our culture and countries destroyed. So what do we say to, to people like that? We need to reassure them. We need to make people understand that talking about race does not necessarily mean you hate everyone who isn't the same colour as you. It certainly doesn't mean we're going to be going out firing up the gas chambers again. There is a real panic about this issue in Europe. And I think people just need a bit of reassurance. Ordinary people, I'm not talking about lefties. I mean, you, you, never, you never talk to them. Uh, but, you know, sane people uh, just need to know what you're actually talking about. You're not saying you hate black people, you're just saying we're, we're talking about the protection of a culture built by white people, and it was built by white people. Them's the facts. Uh, and it's because it was built by white people that, was, that the world is so keen to get rid of it. Uh, no, no. But we also have to reassure people that we're not actually talking about race rights. In fact, one of the reasons I want to talk about this and I want my party to deal with this is because I don't want it to end up there. I don't want it to end up with actual nasty pieces of work getting hold of this because this is bubbling away under the surface. It really, really is. Uh, and if we don't deal with it, if decent people don't deal with it, then someone else will. And they won't be half as decent. Simon. Quite a long question, Anne-Marie, and perhaps, perhaps a statement. Um, the UN talks about migration replacement. Mm. They talk about um, the necessity for that for a European declining population, an elderly population, um, and perhaps low birth rates here. On the surface level, I could ask a rhetorical question. Well, what's the matter with that? What's the matter with the population becoming smaller? I already know the answer to that. The answer to that is at the heart of the matter, this, this migration replacement, is the international monetary system. A debt-based monetary system, fiat currencies, fractional reserve banking, and uncollateralized debt finance. That's, that's what so money. Mean. So money is the issue here. Oh, it, it often is. The more persons we have, the more population growth we have, the more debt is created and the more money is created off the back of that. There is no money creation without debt creation. So if we have a large influx of people, that's more people who are going to work, that's more people that are going to need social welfare and that's borrowing by government. There's more credit card debt, there's more car finance, there's more mortgages, more debt's created, more money's created. So I don't think we can talk about replacement migration in isolation, this is a wider issue, and we can't see it without the context of understanding the monetary system. This is a huge position. Have you a view on that, on what I've just said? It's a perfect storm. People ask me regularly, why is this happening? There's no one reason. You know, the people ask me, why, why are we allowing all this mass immigration from all over the world? Uh, there's no one reason for it. There's several reasons for it. There's loads of vested interests in this. We're given a lot of excuses. The low birth rate is an excuse we get a lot. Look, to, if you ask me, the whole world should be following our, our lead when it comes to birth rates. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we should be a slightly bit higher, replacement level I, at least. Um, but the rest of the world needs to come down rather than us going up, is my view. There's too many people on this planet as it is. And actually, if we could get the birth rates down in the most impoverished countries, the world would be a much better place. But secondly on that, uh, this, we need to import a workforce. Nonsense. Nonsense. We have massive levels of unemployment in Europe. I mean, I remember Angela Merkel using that excuse when she wanted to bring half the world to Germany, most of whom are still on the dole, by the way. Uh, and she knew they would be, because there are, many of whom were uh, illiterate in their own language. So how she expected them to boost the German economy, of all things, is a, is a fantasy, it's a lie. Uh, there is no way they were going to boost the German economy, but even if they had a shortage of staff in Germany, at the time, there was 50% youth unemployment in Spain. So why did she have to reach out to Africa, to people who could never, who didn't, some people who've never, I, I remember a headline, who'd never used toilet roll before. Why did Germany, of all places, think it appropriate to bring a million or more people from there, from, from, from a world where they don't even know toilet paper, when half of Spain is unemployed? It's a lie. It's a big, fat lie. Uh, it's the, creating more debt that's the first, I mean, finance is not the first time. I, I, people have suggested to me that actually there's an intention 
to bunk bankrupt Western countries um, by putting so much pressure on them with social welfare, or at least to put so much financial pressure on the taxpayer. Uh, who has to keep all of these people? And you can see, you know, this, this, we're taxed to the eyeballs as it is. Uh, and when people know what they're paying their taxes for. The economic argument, the, the it'll bring, it'll boost our economy, is a lie, an absolute lie. The birth rates thing is a lie as well, although there is definitely an issue there. But with most things, you're right, money. Rich people are getting rich out of this. Yep. Very, very, very rich out of this. And they're not uh, suffering in the way that the ordinary people are suffering. They're not having uh, their neighbourhoods transformed in front of their eyes. They're not being insulted, spat at in the street on their own. Places, I, I knew a woman in South London, she grew up in a block of flats in South London. She was born and brought home here. She was in her 50s, she still lived there. Her parents lived upstairs. And in that time, she told me that every, basically all of the English were gone and had been replaced by Somalis. And her words to me were not, we don't like them. Her words to me were, Anne-Marie, they hate us. And, that's, you know, and this is where she'd known all her life. You know, so rich people are getting very rich off this, the big business, and we need to talk about big business. Now, I believe in the free market. I'm not, you know, again, you can have this panic. It's almost like the panic of when you talk about race, people go, oh my God, Nazis. You get this stuff when you talk about the place of big business in society. People say, oh my God, communism. She wants state control of production. I don't. That's not what I'm talking about. But we do need to talk about this. We do need to talk about the influence that multinational corporations are having on the migration coming into our part of the world. They want the cheap staff, and they don't give a damn about the impact on the people already here. Big business wants this. Big politicians want it because they want their career. But big business wants it more. And one uh, one uh, really great example of this and why we need to talk about this and a big business place in our society is when the business secretary under Theresa May uh, said that because big businesses didn't want Brexit, they were not going to have a hard Brexit because business yeah. people didn't want them. And business people were saying, well, we'll lose a lot of our staff if you do this. And the government was willing to ignore the vote of the majority because business representatives didn't want Brexit to go through. Now we have to talk about that. We have to talk about big money and big business. It doesn't make us communists, yeah. but they cannot overrule our democratic rights. And in many ways they do. Yeah. My, 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 I suppose my view on it is, sadly, replacement migration will remain a phenomena unless we can see truly international banking reform, a, a completely new model. How to go about that? is um, the multi-billion dollar question. It's, it's, uh, it's an area that I've actually got a couple of meetings set up to talk about. But we're going to come up with a radical economic policy surrounding the structure of banks, so keep an eye out on that. Okay, all right, thanks everyone.